you are watching this video because you have a check engine light and because when you get fuel in your car you have problems starting it if your car has been doing this for a while I have an easy fix with a little part that's really easy to install costs about $15 if you have the dealership do it you might pay a lot more I just got fuel in the car. I'm going to try to start it. You hear it continued to crank over, but it would not start. Sometimes it will start. You can also assist it by pushing the uh, gas pedal almost all the way down during the start. There, it starts right up the second time. It's done this every time now for the last four fuelings. So I'm pretty sure that the code that I got, and you don't need a code reader, but if you do have one, it helps identify the problem. I got a code P0459. And even if you don't have a code reader, that symptom is typical of the part that I'm going to give you a little lesson on. So this is a typical symptom of a solenoid valve that's easy for you to replace. I just ordered one on Amazon, and I'm not endorsing Amazon, but I ordered it online, or you can stop at a local uh, car dealership, or maybe even at a car parts store. Get the part, it only costs $15, and it'll take only about 10 minutes to install. I'm gonna pull into my new heated studio and show you how to replace this part. It's super simple, it'll take you about 10 minutes at the most. So you reach down and pop your hood. You're gonna go up and look for the access for this part. It's right by your oil filler. If I can do this on a cold snowy day, you sure can do this anytime. The only tool it takes is something to turn a bolt, like a like a socket wrench or a pliers. This problem affects many different kinds of GM cars, so you can look up to see if, uh, if this part is for your car. You want to maybe talk with your automotive repair shop too. They should be honest with you and tell you that the purge valve is easy to access and can be replaced at home. On the Enclave, this is a Buick Enclave, to remove this turtle back, is what I call it. I don't know what it's really called, but it covers most of your engine, probably protects it. But you'll have to remove this, and you can do it by hand. There's a little catch uh, mounts under each, each of those. So you have to remove the oil filler cap first. That gets it, or I'm sorry, yeah, it's an oil filler cap. Put it somewhere where you're going to remember where you put it. I put everything in the sink because whenever I'm done, I always wash my hands up. And uh, that's where I'm going to find a part that I maybe forgot. Watch that rubber ring. You don't want it falling anywhere. It, it should stay attached there. Okay, now you're going to undo the snaps gently. But it just kind of uh, snaps loose, kind of like your uh, grates in your refrigerator. It just sits there loosely. And you got to undo each of the catches that are in there see how see how that's designed this here goes to this pin so there's another part you can set aside for later now you're into the area where you need to be this is the culprit this is called the purge evaporator you can actually look at the uh, make and model of your car and find out where exactly your purge valve is. So the culprit is called a purge valve or a vapor canister purge valve solenoid. It's also called an evaporative emission system high purge flow. That's what the code shows when I use a uh, adapter that you can plug in underneath your dash. You really don't need that in this problem because this is probably the culprit and even before you buy the part you can pull this out very easily and try and blow air through it you can pull this part out and simply test it 
blow through it, see if air goes through. If it does, it's broken, you need a new one. If air does not go through this, then you'd wanna to talk to your dealership and find out if there's something else going on with your car. The first step is to release the vacuum leg. Push in the green button and pull it off of there. That button is just the release uh, catch. Set that to the side. I'm gonna put that out of my way. Just remember where you put it. And it's attached to your car, so you're not gonna lose it. The second part is a tiny bit more tricky. You just gotta get your fingernail or a screwdriver in there and release this. It's just a catch for the electrical. See how that is on there? I just released it. Once that's released, you can pull the connector off of there. Like this, there it is. That's the electrical connection. The third step is simply remove this bolt. You can either use a vice grip, a pliers, whatever kind of tool you use to remove bolts typically. And uh, I'm gonna use a socket wrench set because that's how I get in there. That's the easiest way to get in there. If you don't have a socket wrench, you can use a pliers or borrow one from your neighbor. To remove that bolt, you could use a pliers, but I find that a socket wrench set would be a lot better. The only problem could be that you need a metric number 10, metric 10. The United States kind of went metric, so now I have to have two sets of everything. And a car is apparently using metric. I found that this 1332nd socket set uh, is close as well. You can see by measuring it up, it's got a little play in there, but it's tight enough that it should do the trick for you. So whichever size you have will work for you. I chose to attach mine to the drill because it's easier access to get in there and back that uh, bolt out of there. All right, so basically getting the bolt loosened up is the hardest part. Make absolute sure that you do not back this bolt out so far that you drop it down into the engine. And you don't want to lose, leave any of your tools laying in your engine compartment at any time. My father-in-law taught me that. Always have a work area next to your car where you take parts out and never leave them sitting anywhere. And obviously you're not going to ever do this with your engine running because there's belts and fans that could um, actually grab a hold of your hand and pull you into the engine. So the solenoid is held in just by one simple bolt. I'm gonna put that bolt in the sink where I have the other parts. Make sure your sink drain is such that it won't go down the drain. That would be. And then just uh, remove this part. The solenoid is held in by a uh, rubber seal. So you're gonna to have to use a little tension when you pull it out of that hole. So the bolt is here and the solenoid goes into this hole here. And you can see where, when you put your new part in, that's where the bolt would go. You turn that to match the hole. Now the test that I've learned to see if this solenoid works is to blow in it. You hear air going through it? That's why it's failing. The solenoid's job is to not allow vapors to go through when it's not powered. A new one that cost me less than $15 does not let air go through. Before you put your part in, make sure to compare. Yes, we do have the exact same part. And they gave us a new nut for that, or new bolt as well. Make sure you be careful because that washer might be loose. You don't want any parts to fall down into your engine. Now we put the new part back in. I can see that the rubber seal is here and we match up the bolt without letting it go. Push that in all the way then match up the bolt. Turn it in by hand before you, that way everything's matched up before you start putting pressure on it with a tool. Okay, make sure you do not over tighten, which is why a socket wrench is probably better but I have my drill adjusted to not over torque that. Okay, it's in there solid. The next step is to connect up the two parts that I showed you earlier uh, to remove. 
The first one is the electrical connector. Remember this clip locks in. See this lock right here? Okay, make sure that goes in and clips. Did you hear it click? It's clipped in, it's nice and secure. Then the next, the last step, well, not the last step, but the last connection is to get this vacuum hose connected. And you want it to also click. That way all of your parts are in there securely. Now scan your engine, make sure you did not leave any tools or bolts or any parts in your engine. Because once you start it, you could do damage. Now we're going to get the cover back on. Match up. On the Buick, I find that this is a little bit of a puzzle. The goal is to match up these three receiver holes to these three pins. One, two, three. There's the first one. Get it lined up. And then down here, get the back one in at least close. Then the hardest part is keeping the rubber seal around the oil filler cap because the lip of that, in fact, I'm just going to get it out of the way for now. We'll, we'll do that last. Okay, all three clips are in place. You just pop them back. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to test them. There's one that's tight. Okay, all three are tight. Now you got your oil filler rubber seal put that back around there you may have to do a little wiggling you're gonna get dirty fingers after all you are working on your car and that just sits around the edge of that and then you grab your oil filler cap and it's absolutely imperative that you get this to line up and seat all the way down so that you don't have oil purging up out of your engine. If you have any doubts about your capabilities, then ask your shop for help. They should be able to at least tell you what you need to do. And if you're in doubt and you're not sure you're gonna have this done safely, then take your car to the shop. I usually give it a quick little wipe down just because if any fluids are leaking out of this engine, you would want to be able to see that. Now that you have your engine compartment all safely put back together and the cover is back on, the fuel cover or the oil filler cap is back on, and you've cleared all of your tools out of here, then you can close your hood and try starting your car. We'll see how it sounds. The first time it might have air in the system, so it might not start adequately. Starts right up like a charm. Now the engine light may stay on because it threw a code and you, after so many hours, it will clear itself or so many starts. I'm not sure what the parameters are for your car, but essentially you either need to have that code cleared, which your dealership would be glad to charge you $90 for or more, or you just let it time out or you can get uh, a uh, simple little device that plugs in under here. For less than $70, you can get yourself a unit like this. I'm not selling this one, so I'm going to turn it around because my intent is not to promote any particular product. But there are many versions or types, brands of car scanners. This reader will read the codes and tell you what the check engine light is trying to tell you. There are codes for different diagnostic problems on your car, and this will read it for you and send it to your smartphone, or there's handheld devices that read it right out on the screen. So you can shop for that. Um, that's a side point anyway, but that's how I found out what was wrong with my wife's Buick. I connected my code reader. Now I've used this about three or four times already, actually four times now, and uh, found problems that I was able to fix myself. So I do recommend getting a code reader that you connect up underneath the dashboard of your car so that you can at least get a diagnosis of the problem. And that's how I knew how to fix this problem. And there you have it. Your car is back into good operation.
If you found this video helpful, please make comments below. If you have any experience with the parts that we talked about or have any other additional mechanical advice, please make comments below because we can learn from each other. Have a frosty day. Thanks for watching Frosty Life.